right, so our final speaker this afternoon, this evening, is Dr Elisa Chisari from Utrecht University. And this is the RAS Fellowship Talk. And Elisa is going to talk to us about galaxy shapes as a tool for cosmology and galaxy evolution. <coughs> <laughs> right, there we go. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to tell you a little bit about what I did during my RAS uh, fellowship at University of, of Oxford in the past two years. Uh, so in this talk, I want to cover how we're using galaxy shapes as a tool for cosmology and galaxy evolution. And I give you, I'll give you a different perspectives. Some of them are challenges. Some of them are opportunities. <laughs> So um, yeah, with that in mind, let's, uh, let's start. Uh, so first of all, I want to give you an overview of where we stand today in precision cosmology. What are our goals in this um, area? What are the open questions that we are trying to address about the cosmological model? And then I want to move on into telling you how we use galaxy shapes for that purpose. And I'll be talking about two mechanisms that distort galaxy shapes across the universe. So one of them is gravitational lensing, and this is uh, routinely used as a cosmological probe these days to constrain cosmological parameters. And the other one, a bit uh, less known perhaps, it's called intrinsic alignments. And these alignments, we know they're there in the universe. They've been observed to high significance. They act as a contaminant to gravitational lensing, so they get in the way of us extracting the information that we want from, from lensing. But they also have other applications to cosmology and to galaxy evolution, and I hope I can tell you about uh, some of them uh, today. Okay, so precision cosmology is, of course, uh, the study of the origin, composition, and evolution of the universe. And one of the main probes that we have of the cosmological model is the cosmic microwave background, which is depicted here in this map from the Planck collaboration. And here we see the temperature fluctuations that were present in the primordial plasma that was the universe 400,000 years after the Big Bang. From this picture, we've learned a lot because the patterns encoded in this map have told us that the universe is made of um, ordinary matter, only it's uh, 5% approximately. And then we have two dark components that make up the majority of the energy density of the universe today, uh, which are dark matter, uh, roughly 27% of our universe, and dark energy, uh, about 68%. So this, is, this picture is very precise, but uh, we don't really know what dark energy and dark matter are. Uh, there are, of course, proposals for what their nature might be, but the question is, uh, what is the right candidate? So dark matter might be comprised of weakly interactive massive particles. Um, more recently, it was proposed that uh, maybe it's an ultralight scalar field, uh, so so-called axions. Uh, or it might be, or at least a fraction of it, might be comprised of primordial black holes. So which of these possibilities is correct? Um, we don't know. The other big question is what is the nature of dark energy? Is it a cosmological constant that is making the universe expand acceleratedly? And this would be consistent, of course, with the theory of general relativity. Is it perhaps some kind of dynamical field with an equation of state parameterized here with this parameter little w that we'll see again later on? Or is it that we really need to go beyond general relativity to understand why the universe is accelerating its expansion? So so-called uh, modification of gravity that might describe the acceleration of the universe um, that we see today. So we don't know the answer to these questions, and we're going after uh, that answer um, using large-scale galaxy surveys that uh, were mentioned by uh, Joel before me. Uh, so I'll tell you about a little bit about how we do that uh, these days. The other open questions uh, relate to the early universe. So is inflation the right model to describe the um, early stages in the universe that make the CMB, the cosmic microwave background, look the way that it does? And uh, if it is the right model, what was the physics that drove inflation? There are actually many possibilities for what happened during that stage. And again, we don't know much about, um, about this, and now we would like answers to this question. 
So in order to, to find the answers to these questions, we need to, know, to, we need to go beyond the cosmic microwave background. We need to look at how the universe grew uh, gravitationally through the, um, uh, through the gravitational force to form uh, galaxies that we see today, the large-scale structure. So each point in this map is a galaxy from a somewhat old uh, survey now, two mass. Um, and by mapping this structure, we can understand the competition between dark matter, dark energy, and the competition between gravity and expansion, and know uh, a little bit more about these components. So the way that we do this, and this is um, a simulation of the universe called the horizon simulation that I'll show uh, in a few occasions today. The way that we do this is that uh, we map the sky and first of all, we identify uh, galaxies in the sky. So here are the galaxies, the red points. And we can uh, establish relations between their positions that are called correlations. And we can model these correlations and extract cosmological information from them. The other things that we can identify in this map are so-called clusters of galaxies, regions that are agglomerations uh, of galaxies where these galaxies have fallen together through gravity and uh, now they're condensed in these particular regions. We also observe uh, supernovae go off in these galaxies, and this is a well-known way of measuring the expansion history of the universe. Of course, um, the way that uh, showed us that the universe is accelerating its expansion. So this is another way that we have of mapping the universe. And the other thing that we do, finally, is measure the shapes of galaxies, which is uh, what I'll be talking uh, mostly about today. So by putting all of these um, elements of the maps uh, together, we can constrain the parameters of our cosmological models, so depicted here by these uh, quantities um, in the yellow box. Uh, so for example, the energy density matter in the universe today, comprised of dark matter and baryonic matter, energy density in dark energy today, uh, the parameter of the equation of state of dark energy, the acceleration, um, the expansion, sorry, the expansion rate of the universe today, uh, the amount of structure that we see in the universe today, and another parameter that normally makes it to our analysis now because uh, we're sensitive enough to, uh, to set constraints on it, is the sum of the neutrino masses uh, in the universe. And then if we want to probe inflation, we extend this model with some other parameters, and in this talk they will appear as A0 and A2. And so the fact that we can constrain this tells us something about uh, the early stages of the universe. All right, so what is the role of galaxy shapes uh, in extracting uh, cosmological information from these maps? So imagine that you have a galaxy over here in the background and we're observing it uh, through our telescopes over there. The light coming from this galaxy would normally come through a straight path to Earth, but as it travels towards Earth, it encounters a lot of structure of matter in the universe, and as a consequence, it's deviated from its straight path. So instead, it follows a curved path towards Earth. And as a consequence of that, the shape that you see is distorted. It's no longer the original shape of the galaxy, but it becomes a little bit more elliptical in certain directions. And through this uh, phenomenon, we can study the growth of structure and the expansion history of the universe. The only thing that we need to do is to find enough galaxies in our maps that have been distorted in this way to catch these patterns, these correlation patterns of the shapes, and then fit our models that will give us uh, details about how the growth of structure has progressed and how the universe has been expanding. So this gravitational lensing phenomenon gives you direct information about these two uh, properties of the universe which connect to the cosmological parameters that I showed before. So what does gravitational lensing look like in practice? So this is um, a beautiful image from the Hubble Space Telescope where you can see the phenomenon directly by eye. Uh, so the yellowish galaxies that you see here form part of a very big cluster, Abel um, 2218. And you see that some galaxies appear rather strange in this image. So here, over there, you see an arc around this cluster. This is a phenomenon called a strong gravitational lensing. So when the density of the cluster is high enough, it can distort the galaxies in the background severely, and you see these beautiful arcs. But most often, um, the effect is rather weak. So if you really want to use as many galaxies as possible in your maps, 
and catch these coherent parameters, you're really actually looking at 1% level distortions of the ellipticities of galaxies. But the key thing is that the patterns are very coherent, so you're looking for things that look like this. So distortions around the density field in this tangential fashion. And so by looking specifically from, for these patterns, you can isolate the lensing effect and model it with your cosmological model. So if you do that, uh, so this is an example from uh, current surveys. Um, <coughs> if you do that, you can set constraints on the energy density matter today and the amplitude of the density fluctuations today. And so these are results from the kilo degree survey that I've been uh, involved with for several years. And you see that um, our results are shown here in green. So those are our most recent constraints. And then we put them together with the dark energy survey data uh, here in red, you see our new constraints from last year. And uh, we compare them to what Planck says um, the preferred model for the universe is only from the cosmic microwave background. And you see that, uh, well, they used to agree a little bit better. Now they're not agreeing so well anymore. So this could be a sign of um, some tension between our model of the universe today and earlier on. Uh, we don't know yet. This is at the level of 2.5 or 3 sigma, so really only more data will tell whether this is statistically significant or not. But other probes of the local universe are also showing some discrepancies with probes of the early universe. So if you try to estimate the um, Hubble constant from different data that relates to the late universe or the early universe, you start seeing that you get different results. And so the local probes prefer higher values of this expansion rate than the earlier probes of the universe. And the discrepancy is now at something like 4.4 sigma. And again, this could be a statistical uh, fluctuation, so only more data will tell. Uh, but people are already starting to think about possible mechanisms, possible um, changes in the model of the universe that could uh, drive this uh, difference. And so, for example, if you look at the top, this case is a case where we uh, modify the equation of state of dark energy, so it's no longer a cosmological constant. It's some kind of fluid that permeates the universe with an equation of state that's slightly different from the usual minus one for a cosmological constant. So that could be a plausible explanation. So the thing that we need to do now is to go after this value of the, uh, the little w parameter. So that's what we're trying to do with current surveys. So again, this is a result from the kilo degree survey where you see our contours on the value of this W parameter now expanded, Taylor expanded into two numbers, W0 and WA. And if the universe were a cosmological constant, then the data should be consistent with this cross over here. And if you start seeing departures from that, then uh, you might uh, be under a situation where this is not a cosmological constant anymore. But it's, uh, the constraints for now are, are very broad, so we're waiting for the next generation of surveys to improve on that situation. <coughs> so the next generation of surveys is depicted here in green. Uh, so uh, the, the ones that are expected for the next decade are Euclid, LSST, and WFIRST. And these are the ones that are ongoing right now, and these are past surveys that uh, followed similar um, analysis from weak gravitational lensing to deliver cosmological constraints. I've been mostly involved with the LSST survey, uh, so this is going to take place in the Vera Rubin Observatory in Chile, and we'll start taking data in 2021. And it's really going to be a video of the sky because we'll be visiting the same area of the sky um, 800 times over 10 years. So this really has a lot of potential for transient uh, science, uh, but also the fact that uh, you visit all of, this, all of the sky uh, over 10 years, then it means that um, you can also accumulate your data and have very deep images that give you very accurate galaxy shapes for weak lensing. So this is, as I said, uh, progressing um, in construction uh, and it's going at, a, at the right pace. So we hope that in 2021 we'll start uh, taking data. And what this will be capable of is really amazing because here what I've done is I've taken the plot from before and I've put more or less to scale what LSST will be able to do in this parameter space. So it's really going to be a game changer in our ability to constrain the cosmological model. So we might have an answer to what uh, dark energy is after all, um, after the LSST campaign. 
And the constraints from LSST will come from the multi-probe approach that I was showing you before, where we're really going to combine not only the weak lensing in blue, but also the clusters of galaxies in light blue, and uh, the strong lensing in yellow and the supernovae in green to obtain uh, the best constraints that we can on the cosmological model. Okay, and to prepare for all this, uh, of course, we need to build the right tools. So one of the things that, um, that I've been doing is to build um, the theory uh, software tools for this collaboration. And we, de we develop all of our software in, in public, <laughs> so you can see uh, our library over here. Uh, so we intended for a public, as a public product for everyone to use. Um, and this is a major effort in the preparation for uh, the LSST cosmological analysis. <coughs> Okay, so now let me tell you a little bit about uh, the role of um, this other phenomenon that I mentioned, intrinsic alignments in precision uh, cosmology. So what are these intrinsic alignments? Well, weak lensing is a very uh, well-known effect that has been studied for many years. Intrinsic alignments are something a little bit more recent. So in the 2000s, people realized that galaxies are actually... Uh, aligned with respect to each other. So if a galaxy is close to another galaxy, its orientation is not going to be random. It's actually going to be related to the nearby galaxies. And of course, one can think that that can arise because of gravity, <coughs> essentially. So tidal fields in the matter distribution of the universe will tend to align galaxies in particular directions. So you can almost see that by eye in this, uh, in this picture of the horizon simulation where you can see that uh, these galaxies over here tend to point towards these galaxies and those galaxies. This one tends to point towards that one and so on and so forth. So this phenomenon actually happens in the universe. We know the galaxies um, do align. So the, if you have two overdensities, this one and that one, uh, essentially the tidal field of these overdensities in the universe is stretching the galaxy in a particular direction. So that's the best model that we have for the phenomenon at the time. One of the consequences of this is that lensing and alignments are actually coupled. So whenever you're measuring the galaxy shape, you just can't isolate one from the other. So in most cases, you're going to be seeing both things at the same time. So as a consequence of that, we really need to make sure that we have a good model for how galaxies align. So let me show you evidence of these alignments, first of all. So this is uh, from data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, where you see all these points in red with small arrow bars are different from zero. And what that is telling you is that galaxies tend to point towards each other, especially red elliptical galaxies tend to display this phenomenon in the uh, local universe. And the model based on the tidal field does a very good job of describing this data point. So that's the blue line. Uh, but it does a very good job only when galaxies are separated by very large distances, when the phenomenon is actually very weak. But when you go to strong regimes inside the halo, the dark matter halo of a galaxy, then you start seeing deviations from this blue line, and the model cannot describe this region anymore, and you have to make some ad hoc uh, extensions that are not very well uh, motivated physically. So one of the consequences of this phenomenon is that if you um, neglect its existence, and you're trying to constrain the cosmological model depicted here in these parameters that we see over there, which we're already familiar with, if the true universe is at the center of these crosses and you're trying to analyze uh, your data assuming that galaxy shapes are only distorted by gravitational lensing, you're going to make a terrible mistake. So you're going to end up very highly biased. So you really need to model in uh, what the alignments are doing in order to recover unbiased constraints. So I want to tell you a little bit about how we make progress in understanding intrinsic alignments from different approaches. Uh, so first of all, we want to um, make as many observations of this phenomenon as possible using current surveys to make sure that we enable the future surveys to go on. But the observations have their limitations. And so uh, another avenue towards understanding this phenomenon is simulating it with cosmological simulations. And of course, we want to develop a more uh, physically based models, more analytical models that can describe the phenomenon. But not all of it is a problem for gravitational lensing. I also want to um, 
change a little bit the mindset and tell you about opportunities from extracting information from these alignments, cosmological information, but also information about galaxy evolutions. So there are many ways that one can do this, but I just want to give you one example of each um, if, uh, if uh, I have enough time. So in terms of modeling uh, this phenomenon, uh, the best approximation that we have right now, as I told you, is the model based on assuming that the shape of a galaxy is proportional to the tidal field of the universe. And this works very well when the alignment is weak, but it doesn't work very well when the alignment starts to be strong. And so one needs to develop better models for this, and there are ways to do this. So one of the things that we've been looking into is how to develop an effective field theory of the illogical structure, which is a bit like a perturbation uh, theory approach, where you can expand the shape of a galaxy into a series of operators with bias parameters. And these operators are all the operators that are consistent with general relativity that have the symmetry of a galaxy shape. So it's a symmetry argument by which you say, what are all the terms that I can put in that are consistent with the shape of a galaxy? And these bias parameters uh, encompass all the small-scale physics that you don't know about. So, for example, uh, has a galaxy had mergers or not? What has its, its history been? We just uh, put them all into these bias parameters um, that are uh, free numbers that we have to fit from the observations. So that's one way that we're making progress. Uh, we're now developing a way of uh, mapping this uh, model into the parameter space or, or the way that we uh, model the observables more directly so that we can apply it to simulations and current data. From the point of view of simulations, uh, we have um, done analysis where we look at uh, cosmological simulations where you form uh, realistic galaxies, uh, realistic populations of galaxies, and you form thou uh, hundreds of thousands of them. So you can measure this alignment effect and go beyond the regime that observations probe nowadays. So one of the key questions that we had was when we started this program was, uh, what do we see in the simulations? Are the galaxies aligning the way that we see them in the universe? And the answer was actually yes. So we see that the red galaxies tend to align and they do so in ways that is uh, consistent with the observational constraints that we have today. So we were happy when we found um, that the simulations could be used to model these alignments. And now these predictions are being used to model uh, the phenomenon for ESA's uh, Euclid mission. But the population for which uh, things are a bit of a puzzle are for disk um, blue galaxies. And in the case of these galaxies, we see much less alignment. So these are the blue curves over here that are very close to zero, contrasted to the curves over here, which correspond to the red galaxies at different times in the history of the universe. So for the blue galaxies, we see much less alignment than for the red galaxies. And we also see that that alignment was stronger in the past than it is today. So on the one hand, that might explain why we're not seeing alignments of blue galaxies today in the data. <coughs> But on the other hand, other simulations tend to predict different trends for these blue galaxies. So there's still a little bit of the puzzle. Why do the blue galaxies align the way that they do in some simulations and why they don't in other simulations? And we think that blue galaxies um, are different from the elliptical red galaxies because in their case you have the plane of the disk which has a significant angular momentum and the mechanism that aligns that galaxy would actually be based on torques of that angular momentum rather than stretching by the tidal field. So that would naturally lead to a lower amplitude of alignment for the disks. So we go after these alignments also in observation. So these are results from um, the KIDS uh, team, again, uh, where you can see that uh, using or lensing data, we can also probe this alignment phenomenon. And we went after the alignment of the red galaxies and the blue galaxies, and we saw that the red galaxies indeed align consistently with previous results, and we derived some constraints that are useful for future surveys. But we also see that the blue galaxies don't align, so we don't have any alignment here. All these points are consistent with zero. And this fits very well the picture that I was telling you where the galaxy uh, shapes in the case of the blue galaxies actually follow an angular momentum uh, torquing uh, pattern, and so it's naturally smaller than the other case. 
So now let's talk about opportunities with intrinsic alignment. So not all, not all uh, is bad news uh, for Lansing in terms of the limitations that they pose to the cosmological program, but we can also use them to extract cosmological information. If we assume that this model holds for the elliptical galaxies, the model based on uh, the tidal field of the universe uh, stretching the elliptical galaxy, then um, we might as well um, use this information to try to probe the cosmological model. There must be some information encoded in this tidal field. And indeed there is, uh, so there are multiple things that one can go after, but I think the most promising one is to test uh, theories of inflation of a very early universe. And so now um, I'm going to show you some forecasted uh, constraints on the parameters for inflation and tell you how uh, we're thinking of exploring this with future data. So first of all, I showed you this picture before. Uh, we know that galaxies align uh, in the universe. We see that in observations, we see that in simulations. So again, these are the red galaxies in the horizon simulation and you see them aligned. Now, um, we also see, both in observations and in simulation, that this alignment strength depends on how you make the measurement of the shape. So depending on whether you're measuring the shape in the inner region of the galaxy, which is closer to the bulge, or the outer regions, you're going to get a different strength of alignment. So I'm going to flip between two different shape measurements and you'll see the shapes changing a bit. And in the uh, first case, in the red case, the alignments are much stronger than in the second case where we're weighting the inner region of a galaxy more. So they're a little bit more round. So the bottom line is the outskirts of galaxies are more aligned. And one can get different measurements of the alignments by doing multiple shape measurements of a galaxy. So if you do that, if you take this uh, multi-shape uh, measurement and you put that information together, so now you have two measurements of shapes and not one, then you can set constraints on these parameters of the early universe. So the way that this works is that um, the early universe models can predict some uh, enhancement of the tidal field at early times that then propagates into the alignments of galaxies. And that's why we're able to constrain uh, these parameters uh, in principle. So by putting this together, we can get constraints that would be competitive with uh, the cosmic microwave background in a completely different regime. So finally, uh, let me say a little bit about how alignments can be useful to study um, galaxy evolution. Uh, so in working with, uh, with the, the numerical simulations, um, we uh, measured the alignment patterns in cases where we had an universe which had active uh, galactic nuclei in the center of galaxies and a universe that uh, did not have active galactic nuclei. And the reason that we expected these patterns, the alignment patterns to be slightly different is that it's very important to quench a galaxy and to form an elliptical galaxy to have active galactic nuclei in their center. If not, then you're going to get a larger population of disks because uh, the gas will keep on falling in and rebuilding the disk of the galaxy. So that means that the alignment pattern must be different because you simply have uh, different populations in your simulation. And so we went after this in the simulations and we found that indeed a universe uh, with AGN, so that's the black curve, has much more alignment than the universe with, without AGN, which is the, the dashed uh, curve. And so in principle, this alignment pattern could be used to uh, connect um, to the physics of the AGN. And uh, so we're now thinking about ways of furthering this and constraining it uh, with current data, but I think it's one of the avenues that we can uh, learn about galaxy evolution from intrinsic alignments. Okay, so I think the future is bright. I think um, current measurements from uh, weak lensing are, uh, have uh, reached an era of maturity where they're able to give us cosmological constraints. <coughs> They're consistent for now with lambda CDM, with mild tensions that might be statistical, might be not, uh, only time will tell. So within the next few years, I think we'll have the answer to this uh, question. The new experiments are starting in 2021, so that is very soon. And they will take a multi-probe approach to cosmology, so that's why we're starting to build all the tools that we need to drive the, um, the scientific campaigns of those surveys. And intrinsic alignments are part of that campaign, so they're a challenge to gravitational lensing in that we need to model them very accurately to extract precision cosmology. 
but they might also be a new avenue uh, to extract uh, information about the cosmological model and about galaxy evolution. So with that, I want to thank you and I would like to thank uh, Royal Astronomical Society for supporting my program over those uh, two years and also for supporting uh, my student, uh, James Bate, who did uh, his summer research with me at Oxford. Okay. Thank you very much, Elisa. We have time for a couple of questions. Yes, sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Just a point of information. When you talk about elliptical galaxies, are we talking about a spiral galaxy that seem at an, you know, uh, at an inc inclined, or are we talking about an actual elliptical? <laughs> No, we're normally talking about an actual elliptical. We think um, the spirals, regardless of how we see them, <laughs> whether we see them face on or edge on, they will have the same, uh, all of them will have the same mechanism align them. And that should be distinguished for the mechanism that aligns an actual elliptical galaxy. Um, the problem is that the data nowadays is um, not, uh, we don't have enough data to make distinction between color and morphology. So uh, for now, we're always thinking about red galaxies as being ellipticals and disks as being blue galaxies because we don't have enough data to make that distinction. But we think there should be a distinction to be made there. Thank you. Um, I'd like to refer back to Professor Bovey's talk earlier where he was talking about um, that the Milky Way had lots of little galaxies in there. Are you seeing that in those models that you can see these small events of mergers or uh, interactions between galaxies in your model? Right. Um, so that's a very interesting question. So indeed, um, depending on how many mergers a galaxy has had, um, we know from simulations that the more mergers you have, the more aligned you will be. So, in principle, this is a way in which you could connect the alignment, the amount of alignment that you see, to the number of mergers that you had. And we're looking into trying to make that statistical connection so that we can learn a little bit more about the mergers, um, the merger history of galaxies. Is that due to the flow of those galaxies, those mergers causing the alignment, do you think? Well, we don't know exactly uh, because we don't have the time resolution in these simulations to look for that. Um, the only thing that we know is that uh, the number of mergers determine the amplitude of the alignments. Uh, it could be because they come from particular directions that correlate with the tidal field. We don't know yet. <laughs> okay, so Elisa, it's fantastic to see how productive you've been during your RAS fellowship. So thank you very much for telling us all about that today. And we wish you all the best for your, you. your new position. Um, so just to close the meeting then, um, just to remind you that we have a drinks reception in the RES library immediately following um, this meeting. And finally, I give notice that the next monthly ANG open meeting of the Society will be on Friday the 13th of March. So hope to see you all then.